Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here. This is one of the best turnouts I've seen for Story Hour. And it's no surprise, we know that Maxine Hong Kingston is beloved on campus and beyond. So we're thrilled to have her here today. We're also happy to have the ASUC bookstore here selling books. And our author has graciously agreed to sign after the reading tonight. So just a few things, the usual. Turn off your cell phones. You all know that. Please, we'd love to see you on our Facebook page. That's where you can get up-to-date information on Story Hour, including that's probably where we'll announce our season first. We've got some great names lined up for next year. So that's facebook.com slash story hour. You can also sign up for our general mailing list. That's at the front desk. You can sign up for Story Hour updates as well as library updates as well. Hear about all the other events we do. Um, I think that that is about it. So I'll turn it over to Vikram now. And please enjoy your evening. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Um, I wrote up an introduction. I now look at you and think this is probably redundant. You guys know all this already, but I will go ahead. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Maxine Hong Kingston back to campus. Uh, she taught in the English department from 1990, and we were just trying to figure out when she retired. We think it was about 2002. <laughs> Uh, she's now a professor emeritus. Emerita? Emeritus. Uh, she first came to the university at the age of 17 to enter the engineering program. After transferring into the English department during her sophomore year, she graduated in 1962. Her literary papers are preserved here in this library, so her connection to Cal is a long-lasting and profound one. She was born in Stockton, California. Her father had been brought up in China as a scholar, poet, and calligrapher. But after coming to the United States, he worked as a laundry owner and the manager of a gambling house to support his family. Her mother had been trained as a midwife and medical practitioner in China. And after following her husband to the US, she worked in laundries and occasionally as a field hand in order to put her children through school. Maxine's first two books, The Woman Warrior and Chinaman, which uh, she suggested may, might be thought of as one very large book, portray her relationships with these two powerful individuals and the larger immigrant community. Bo both books are classified as nonfiction, but they are actually incandescent mixtures of autobiography, legend, and the newly created mythology and dreams of immigrants and their history. Especially in The war Woman Warrior, the tales told to the young protagonist by her mother and other story talkers as lessons, cautions, and instructions for living transform the landscapes of California into the location of a journey that is both commonplace and epic, the quest of the newcomer, the one who belongs between worlds. The Woman Warrior won the National Book Critics Circle Award in 1976 and Chinaman the National Book Award in 1981. In Maxine's 1988 novel, Tripmaster Monkey, the protagonist is the young Berkeley grad Whitman Ah Singh, whose father tries to name him after the, American, uh, the famous American poet. That the father doesn't get it quite right, it's W-I-T-T-M-A-N, um, is the perfect representation of young Whitman's dilemma. He is as American as the other Whitman, and yet, because of the way he looks, his assimilation is completely invisible to his countrymen, who insist on him being inscrutable and Chinese. But China is present to Whitman, as he puts it, only in back scratcher, swizzle sticks, pointed chopsticks for the hair, uh, jade east aftershave in a Buddha-shaped bottle. Whitman, who is a playwright, takes on the aspect of the trickster monkey king of Chinese legend and makes, his, makes it his mission to invent what it means to be Chinese American without the hyphen. The result is a novel of boundless energy and wit. In The New Republic, Ann Tyler wrote that Whitman is Chinese gives his story depth and particularity, that he's American lends his narrative style a certain slangy insouciance, that he's Chinese American with the self-perceived outsider's edgy angle of vision makes for a novel of satisfying complexity and bite and verve. The sequel to Tripmaster Monkey was to be a novel called The Fourth Book of Peace after a Chinese legend about the human quest for peace being destroyed by fire. In one of those real life ironies that you can't ever put in fiction, while Maxine was away attending her father's funeral, her home was destroyed by a fire, which also took the manuscript which she had been working on for many years. She began again, and the result was a book called The Fifth Book of Peace, which was not at all a traditional novel. 
Publishers Weekly observed that it was written in a panoply of languages, American, Chinese, poetry, dreams, mythos, song, history, hallucination, meditation, tragedy. Apart from the continued story of Whitman Ah Sing, the book also contains meditations on her father's funeral, the Chinese legend of the Three Books of Peace, and the experience of running workshop, uh, writing workshops for Vietnam veterans. Maxine has also published Hawaii One Summer, a collection of essays, and To Be the Poet, which is a collection of poetry, as well as a consideration of the meaning, the possibility, and the power of the life of the poet. Her latest book, I Love a Broad Margin to My Life, is a memoir in verse. Donna Seaman wrote in Book List, Kingston's language is so natural, lucid, and subtly rhythmic, reading it as, is as effortless as breathing. In this book, Maxine writes, Karma does not mean doomed. All it means, work. Her writing over the decades has demonstrated that for the writer, work and breathing are the same inseparable thing necessary for life itself. Please join me in welcoming Maxine Hong Kingston. Thank you, Vikram, for that very thorough introduction. And thank you all for welcoming me back here to the Morrison Room. Uh, the last time I was here, I read from uh, To Be the Poet. And, um, and that, in that um, book, I write about uh, the, um, uh, th this, this dream that I have, that I would uh, no longer be a prose writer, but, uh, but I would be a poet. So in, uh, this, in the continuity, I, uh, I just want to read to you uh, the beginning of uh, To Be the Poet, and um, maybe some of you uh, will remember um, my stating all of this. Um, I, I, it seems to me I read it when I was still writing it. And uh, so maybe you, if you were here, you heard an early draft. Uh, but this is the way uh, To Be the Poet begins. I have almost finished writing my long book. Let my life as poet begin. I want the life of the poet. I have labored for over 12 years, 1,000 pages of prose. Now I want the easiness of poetry, the brevity of the poem. Poets are always happy. I want to be always happy. No plotting any more plots. For the long book about the long wars in Vietnam and in the Middle East, I sacrificed time with my child, grown and gone, and my husband and family and friends who should have been loved more. The long book has got to be done soon, and I'll be free to live. I won't be a workhorse anymore. Uh, those were Yatov Shenko's words. He said that uh, all a prose writer has to do is be a workhorse, and then you've got the book. <laughs> I'll be a skylark, free of obligations. I am 60 years old. I have enough reputation and fame and money. Poets don't care too much for money. I declare to you, I'm making a try for poetry. Say one becomes poet by grace. Beauty and truth hap upon the poet. All gift, no labor. The muse flies over and drops jewels upon the poet's head and into open hands. I will go about lifting an empty basket to the air. I um, went out to dinner with uh, Bob Hass, who started this series, and with uh, Brenda Hillman, and with Gary Snyder, and uh, I broached this idea to them. And I said, well, I'm going to be a poet, too, because it's so easy. <laughs> uh, and 
I mean, a, a, a poet is, is uh, inspired. A poet is a person who's in a state of grace. And all you have to do is wait, and the muse gives you the gifts. And they just, they didn't even laugh <laughs> when I said that. I mean, and, and Brenda, she said, oh, no, no. A poet's life is tragic. And I thought, oh, well, OK. And the, the three of them just argued against this. But um, I uh, hung on to my values. And, um, and then when I uh, got done with the long book, I thought, OK, now I'm going to write poetry. One reason is that Tripmaster Monkey took me 10 years. And the fifth book of peace took 12 years. And I thought, OK, I can't afford to uh, spend a decade a book anymore. So now I've got to write poetry, because it's short and it's easy. <laughs> and so here, uh, carrying out this idea, I, um, I'm going to read you the beginning of um, uh, I Love a Broad Margin to My Life, which is a 225-page poem. <laughs> and, uh, and I set up rules for myself that uh, I will take it easy. I will only, um, I, I will see whether I am blessed or whether I am gifted. I will not try hard. I will not push. I'll just wait and uh, see what the muse will give me. And uh, I, will use, I will use whatever happens every day, uh, like a diary, because diaries are easy and natural. I am turning 65 years of age. In two weeks, I will be 65 years old. I can accumulate time and lose time. I sit here writing in the dark, can't see to change these penciled words, just like my mother, alone, bent over her writing, just like my father, bent over his writing, alone but for me watching. She got out of bed, wrapped herself in a blanket, and wrote down the strange sounds father who was dead, was intoning to her. He was reading aloud calligraphy that he'd written, carved with ink brush on his tombstone. She wasn't writing in answer. She wasn't writing a letter. Who was she writing to? Nobody. This well-deep outpouring is not for anything. Yet we have to put into exact words what we are given to see, hear, know. Mother's eyesight blurred. She saw trash as flowers. Oh, how very beautiful. She was lucky, seeing beauty, living in beauty, whether or not it was there. I am often looking in mirrors and singling out my face in group photographs. Am I pretty at 65? What does old look like? Sometimes I am wrinkled, sometimes not. So much depends upon lighting. A camera crew shot pictures of me, one of five most influential people over 60 in the East Bay. <laughs> I am homely. I am old. I look like a tortoise in a curly white wig. I am stretching head and neck toward the light. Such effort to lift the head, to open the eyes. Black, shiny, lashless eyes. Talking mouth. I must utter you something. My wrists are crossed in my lap. Wrinkles run up the left forearm. It's my right shoulder that hurts. Rollerblading accident. Does the pain show? Does my hiding it? I should have spoken up. Don't take my picture, not in that glare. 
One side of my neck and one cheek are gone in black shadow. Nobody looks good in hard focus, high contrast. Black sweater and skirt, white hair, white sofa, white curtains. My colors and my home, but rearranged. The crew had pushed the reds and blues and greens aside. The photographer, a young woman, said, great, great. From within my body, I can't sense that crease on my left cheek. I have to get win compliments. You are beautiful, so cute, such a kind face. You are simple, you move fast, chocolate chip. A student I taught long ago called me chocolate chip. And only yesterday, a lifelong friend told Earl, my husband, he's lucky he's got me, the chocolate chip. <laughs> they think, they mean, I think, my round face and brown bead eyes. I keep count. I mind that I be good looking. I don't want to look like grandmother. Ah, poor. Her likeness is the mask of tragedy. An ape weeps when another ape weeps. She is ancestress. She is prayed to. She sits the queen, center of the family in China, center of the family portrait. My mother in it too. Generations of in-laws around her. All is black and white, but for a dot of jade green at Pa's ears and a curve of jade green at her wrist. Lotus lily feet show from the hem of her gown. She wanted to be a beauty. She lived to be 100. My mother lived to be 100. 103, she said. Chinese lie about their age, <laughs> making themselves older. Or maybe she was 97 when the lady official from Social Security visited her, as the government visits everyone who claims to be one, who claims a 100th birthday. Mama showed off. She pedaled her exercise bike, <laughs> hammer curled hot pink barbells, suddenly stopped. What if Social Security won't believe she's a century old. Here's a way for calculating age. Subtract from her age of death my age now. 100 minus 65 equals 35. I am 35 years to go. Lately, I've been writing a book a decade. I have time to write three more books. Jane Austen wrote six books. I've written six books. Hers are six big ones. Mine, four big ones and two small ones. I take refuge in numbers. I waste my time with Sudoku. <laughs> Day dawns, I am greedy, helpless to begin six star difficulty Sudoku. Sun goes down, I'm still stuck for that square that will let the numbers fly into place. What good am I getting out of this? I'm not stopping time. Nothing to show for my expenditures. Pure nothing. OK, so I am already showing that uh, you can get material for your poems just by looking in the mirror. Yeah? <laughs> and thinking about age and mortality. Uh, I'm going to skip a couple of days of this, uh, of this diary-like writing, and uh, I'm going to skip to uh, a section which explains the title. Seven days before my birthday, I had breakfast with Mary Gordon who's always saying things I never thought before. It's capitalistic of us to expect any good from peace demonstrations, as if ritual has to have use, gain, profit. I agreed. Yes, it's Buddhist to go parading for the sake of parading. K 
Can you think of a writer besides Chekhov who is holy and an artist? Grace Paley. She smiled. Well, yes, obviously. Thoreau. Oh, no. Thoreau's too Protestant. Tidy. Non-sexual. He goes home to mom for hot chocolate. <laughs> no sex. No tragedy. No humor. Come to think of it, Thoreau doesn't make me laugh. A line from Walden hangs over one of my desks. I love a broad margin to my life. Sitting here at this sidewalk cafe with Mary, deliberately taking time off from writing and teaching duties, I am making a broad margin to my life. The margin will be broader when we part and I am alone. Thoreau swam, then sat in the doorway of his shelter, large box, dwelling house, alone all the summer morning, wrapped in the sunlight and the trees and the stillness. Birds flitted through the house, until by the sun falling in at my west window or the noise of some traveler's wagon on the distant highway, I was reminded of the lapse of time. I have a casita of my own, built instead of a garage after the big fire. Its width is the same as the rose, 10 feet. Its length a yard longer. He's had a loft. He had a loft. I have a skylight. I want to be a painter. Sometimes I hear the freeway, now and again the train and the campanile. Thoreau heard the band playing military music. His neighbors were going to war against Mexico. He made up his mind not to pay taxes. Trying broad margin meditation, I sit in the sunny doorway of my casita amidst the yucca and loquats and purple rain birches. Some I planted, some volunteered. Birds, chickadees, finches, sparrows, pairs of doves, a pair of towies, and their enemy, the jay. Hawk overhead, barn swallows at twilight. I know, the row sat with notebook and pencil in hand, days full of writing. Um. I go, uh, I um, emulate Thoreau in uh, many ways. Uh, one way is that I, um, I, I quote it directly from Walden and embedded his lines into my lines uh, in this description that I just read. I, I put his birds and then I put my birds. And uh, one way, uh, what I wanted to do was to be influenced by him. Um, not just his ideas, but the rhythm of, uh, of his language. Um, and, and of course, I also wanted to, um, I also use him as uh, uh, a role model and my example. So there he was, uh, not really being able to get away. He's sitting there at the threshold of his, um, of his house and uh, and he hears the band music, and he thinks to himself, my, my neighbors are going to war against Mexico. And, uh, and then he decides not to pay his taxes. So I am um, going to read to you a scene where I follow Thoreau's example. Um, one way that I've um, organized this book uh, this long poem is that I, I'm thinking about um, the uh, the Chinese ink ink scrolls, and uh, the, this book is about many journeys, and and I I show each journey as if it was on a uh, a scroll, and uh, the scrolls will have paintings of the. Uh, of everything you see along the ro route, um, and 
and you you will see rivers, and then and you will see mountains, and uh, and you see uh, you see the birds flying and the ho and the horses going, and and the same person is uh, is going uh, along the route. Um, I, I think that uh, Gary Snyder used that same idea when he did uh, Mountains and Rivers Without End. Uh, he, he's, uh, he's also using the, 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 uh, the visual scroll as a way to organize uh, the poetry. Um, here I am, um, uh, the, uh, the journey is a uh, a peace demonstration, and uh, and I, um, uh, I I write about uh, peace demonstrations in San Francisco, and then it segues into a peace demonstration in Washington, D.C. Um, you might also listen for um, uh, for. Uh, lines from uh, Walt Whitman. And I use him in the same way that I use Thoreau. I embed his lines, and then I see whether I could sing along, and it would influence my own um, rhythms. In San Francisco, we were a peace dragon with 100,000 pairs of feet walking up and down the city hills. From rooftops and balconies rained rice as at weddings, and water on the summer's day, and rose petals, and red and motley confetti. In Washington, D.C., on International Women's Day 2003, our peace dragoness was a mile long, winding our way to the White House. One million people marched in Rome. One million people. One million people marched in Rome, and thousands of Shiite and Sunni Muslims together in Baghdad. Oh, democracy, I will make inseparable cities with their arms about each other's necks. For the first time in history, the area in front of the White House fence was banned to demonstrators. The U.S. Park Police stopped us at Pennsylvania Avenue. So we sat in. We sat ourselves down upon the historic ground, our house, our street. The rangers are friendly and will converse, used to being helpful to tourists. We have a permit. Didn't you get a copy? You promised we could parade in front of the White House, our house, our street. The permit's for only 25 people. OK, so let's count off 25. One, two, three, four, five. I was ninth, nine, my lucky number. I said my number and stepped between the rangers. Running at us, whooping, cheering, came a pink-clad crowd, the tail of the dragon. They had gotten through the police line at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. We rushed to meet them, hugging, holding one another, happy. We completed the ring around our house. A troop gathers around me. Some walk by my side and some behind, and some embrace my arms or neck. Thicker they come, a great crowd, and I in the middle. The encirclement lasted for moments. Then the crowd cooperated with the police, who asked them and ordered them off the street. They retreated to the borders of Lafayette Park. There they stayed, keeping an eye on the 25 of us who stood at the curb of the White House sidewalk. In the middle of the park, drummers, Native Americans, drummed, banging day and night. The president won't sleep till he calls off, shock and awe. Wave to the drummers, dance to the drumming, sing and dance to our own singing ululation, and give peace a chance. Wave to the peace marchers, wave to the police, wave to the children of Iraq. Everyone I saw was nonviolent. The man with the bullhorn and the blow-ups of abortions disappeared. Counter-demonstrators disappeared. Everywhere I looked was peace. Each woman cared for the women around her, and love grew. 
love and love returning, love and returning love, love reverberating, love magnifying. I felt love palpable and saw love manifest. It's pink. Air and light turn dawn pink, the color I imagine yin, the color of aired blood, the pink mist at explosions. I was desperate for miracle. Perhaps the reason I could open my arms wide and gather up great big pink balls of peace and hurl them east toward Iraq and turn and hurl them at the White House. I'm not the only one. Other women also threw pink balls of peace to the Iraqi children to protect them and at the White House. Catch, George. Catch, Laura. The many kinds of police kept arriving. First, the law enforcement park rangers, who I think are federal police. Then came the metropolitan police, which included mounted police and motorcycle cops then SWAT teams, tax squads, easy to practice nonviolence with the friendly park rangers. How about giving me your code pink button for my wife? We petted and talked to the horses, but the SWAT, tax, one-way glass over faces, Everyone in the same robot stance, a rank of robots, weapons, any women, can't tell, impervious to us. The officer shouting and giving us orders was a DC cop. Get off the street. Arrests will begin in 20 minutes. 20 minutes and more passed. He announced again and again, Arrests in 20 minutes. They didn't really want to arrest us. They hoped we would go away. We were having a standoff. Without discussion, we 25 women all together took slow steps backward through the yellow tape. We waved our arms and pink scarves and ribbons, waving goodbye to our supporters who stood witness on the three far sides of the park. Waving goodbye to the police. We are getting off the street. We walked backward, broke the yellow tape, up onto the curb, into the restricted zone, White House sidewalk. Slowly, imperceptibly moving so as not to provoke violent arrest, singing salam, peace, shalom, we reach the White House fence. Two grandmothers ago, our ancestresses chained themselves to this black iron fence. I held its bars in my hands, laid my face against the barricade, and felt tears rise. The other women were crying too and cheering and dancing. Now the police saw we had unambiguously broken a law. Time to start the arrest. All the police came to attention. The rangers blocking the left side of the street, the tax squad the right, and the city cops in a blue line facing us, the width of the street between. On the White House roof, a man in uniform aimed a high-powered, long-range sharpshooter rifle at us. He aimed it, put it down, aimed, put it down. A van drove into the cordon area. I think the insignia on it said federal prison. Two or three cops unfolded a tarp and taped it onto the side of the van, covering over the words. I got afraid. They're hiding the place where they would take us. They would disappear us. They're going to drive us through the streets of the Capitol in an unmarked white vehicle. No one would know what became of us. Keep singing. Keep loving. Say in unequivocal words, I love you. Here, I love you, Maxine. The Metropolitan Police the men stood in one line formation. 
The women, we, the demonstrators, drew one another close. We were a bouquet knot of pink roses. How can it be that all the cops are men and all for peace women? I can't live in such a world. I don't want to keep living out the myth that men fight and women mother. One boy crossed the wide floor, chose one girl, escorted her back to the other side where he arrested her. We regressed the junior high dance. <laughs> My wife is going to kill me, said a black cop. I'm arresting Alice Walker. <laughs> Don't hold hands with me, said a white cop, shaking off his partner who was smiling up at him. Don't take my arm either. They had each one of us stand by herself alongside the van and took our pictures. Quit smiling. What are you smiling for? This is an arrest. This is your mug shot, not your prom photo. I was smiling from happiness. My government will not disappear me. The tarp was but backdrop for shooting pigs. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful pink aura was still upon me. My cop and I did not speak. A woman officer in casual uniform, no gun, took my purse, hair clips, pink poncho, and earrings and put them in a plastic bag. Ready for handcuffing, I presented my hands, wrists together in front but my arresting officer signaled in back. I won't be able to write, to touch, to catch myself and will fall on my face. I turned about, held my arms behind me as high as I could, bending way forward, making my gestures large for the witnesses to see. Handcuffs in this age of new plastics work like the ties for bread and trees. My arrestor could have tightened the cable tie so that it cut into the skin. The hands turned blue, burst. These police were kind to tie us loosely. Our belongings taken, our pictures taken, handcuffed, we were made to get into a paddy wagon, about eight per wagon. There are cages, like dog cages, between the front seat and the side benches. I sat in the middle of a bench, my shoulders touching women's shoulders beside me, my legs touching women's legs before me. Women outside pounded, drummed on the van. Through the windshield, we could see them applauding us. Somebody said, there's my daughter. The van started up. The crowd parted. Let the van through. It got quiet. We were driving away from the magic. The rose light went out. OK, so um, there we were at this amazing demonstration on International Women's Day. and. Uh, the, uh, the people who came were uh, poets, painters, artists, uh, dancers, musicians, uh, puppeteers, and everyone brought their best art. Um, there were poets, uh, poets for peace, who brought a, a great, long, uh, rolled up scroll of, uh, of, of their poetry. And everyone uh, perform their best art, um, and uh, uh, hoping that uh, that th that our art could uh, prevent war. And uh, and then um, and then we were arrested and taken away, and uh, and. It was 12 or 20 days later, and then shock and awe began. And, and, and so the war began, even after we've done our best nonviolence. And then, of course, later, you, you think to yourself, well, um, 
Well, will you go into despair uh, about uh, do tactics of nonviolence work? Uh, you doubt uh, your abilities. You you doubt the ability of um, of art to make peace. Um, and uh, and so somewhere in this book, I um, I have a, a very tentative. Um, thought about what good art and uh, nonviolence do. Um, uh, maybe, maybe they do have some good, but maybe we have to think and work in the long term. It's not that we can stop something after it's already begun in 12 days. Um, but while I was writing this, I'm still uh, uh, despairing and uh, and so the, my um, answer to the question uh, can uh, nonviolence loving nonviolence and can art uh, make peace uh, I answer that question but I answered it very tentatively and it's in parentheses in this poem An act of love I do this morning saves a life on a far future battlefield. And the surprising love I feel that saves my life comes from a person whose soul, somehow corresponding with my soul, doing me a good deed 1,000 years ago. Um, I'm going to read that again in order to make it more real, uh, to just get it out there into the world and, and make this idea real. An act of love I do this morning saves, yeah. see this idea has barely been thought. An act of love I do this morning saves a life on a far future battlefield. And the surprising love I feel that saves my life comes from a person whose soul, somehow corresponding with my soul, doing me a good deed 1,000 years ago. This, um, this new poem, this new long poem, gives me a chance to finish some of the stories that I began long ago and I never found, uh, I never found the happy ending. And uh, so I want to read to you a, um, uh, one of the first things I ever published. This is the first uh, uh, a chapter in um, in the woman warrior, and uh, and this is the a curse that was put on our family. And uh, this is from the point of view of my mother, who's uh, telling me this story about my aunt. Your aunt could not have been pregnant. Her husband had been gone for years. The village had been counting. On the night the baby was to be born, the villagers raided our house. Some were crying. Like a great saw, teeth strung with lights, files of people walked zigzag across our land, tearing the rice. Their lanterns doubled in the disturbed black water, which drained away through the broken buns. As the villagers closed in, we could see that some of them, probably men and women we knew well, wore white masks. The people with long hair hung it over their faces. Women with short hair made it stand up on end. Some had tied white bands around their foreheads, arms, and legs. 
They threw mud and rocks at the house. They threw eggs and began slaughtering our stock. We could hear the animals scream their deaths, the roosters, the pigs, a last great roar from the ox. Familiar wild heads flared in our night windows. The villagers encircled us. Some of the faces stopped to peer at us, their eyes rushing like searchlights, the hands flattened against the panes, framed heads and left red prints. The villagers broke in the front and the back doors at the same time, even though we had not locked the doors against them. Their knives dripped with the blood of our animals. They smeared blood on the doors and walls. One woman swung a chicken whose throat she had slit, splattering blood in red arcs about her. We stood together in the middle of our house, in the family hall, with the pictures and tables of the ancestors around us, and looked straight ahead. The old woman from the next field swept a broom through the air and loosed the spirits of the broom over our heads. Pig, ghost, pig, they sobbed and scolded while they ruined our house. When they left, they took sugar and oranges to bless themselves. They cut pieces from the dead animals. Some of them took bowls that were not broken and clothes that were not torn. Afterward, we swept up the rice and sewed it back up into sacks. But the smells from the spilled preserves lasted. Your aunt gave birth in the pigsty that night. The next morning, when I went for the water, I found her I found her, I found her and the baby plugging up the family well. The last paragraph of this story um, shows the relation between, uh, between the writer and the people in the story. My aunt haunts me, her ghost drawn to me because now, after years of neglect, I alone devote pages of paper to her. I do not think she always means me well. I am telling on her, and she was a spite suicide, drowning herself in the drinking water. The Chinese are always very frightened of the drowned one whose weeping ghost, wet hair hanging and skin bloated, waits silently by the water to pull down a substitute. So you see how this story ends without uh, 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 resolution, with, without uh, reconciliation, uh, without justice. Uh, let alone a happy ending. Um, so, the the uh, the way that life works, um, and also continuing my um, the rule that I made for myself, the rule of poetry, that I will just wait and see what comes. And uh, so two years ago, we were traveling in China and uh, went to that village, my father's village, and, uh, and the, uh, the ending of, uh, of that story came. So we were standing there in the, in the plaza, in the village square. A crone, we, shriveled to my size, gripped my hand tight in her hand, which was cold and clammy. She said, you and I are very related. We are Ho-Chan. I thought, don't touch me. I don't want to catch your disease. I felt her hard bones around my wrist, my arm. In her other hand was a bowl of water. She let go of me and with both hands offered me water, water from the well. Her hand was cold and wet because of clear, clean well water. 
I touched the water as cold as though iced. I touched it with both hands, put both hands into the water, then touched my forehead, touched my eyes, and held my palms against my cheeks, held my face in my hands. I am blessing myself and my aunt. And all that happened. Earl did as I did, the crone standing before him, proffering the bowl of water. On this hot day, we did not drink. The water was not meant for us to drink. The crowd was not looking at us. When a Chinese crowd will gather and look at anything, Watch who wins the haggling. Watch the street barber cut hair. Watch anybody write anything. The villagers were looking away, knowing we had shame, we had curse. They gave us privacy, gave us face. Are they wondering whether I am wondering? Do they know? Do they know that I know? The crone woman, now where is she? Is she old enough to have witnessed the raid on our house? The people at the old folks club, had, ta had they taken part? Killing the animals, hounding my aunt, the men, one of those men, her rapist, her lover. She gave birth in the pigsty. She drowned, and the baby drowned in this very well. Are these things ever past? Kids saw. Can you ever get over it? Sex, bad. Birthing, bad. Woman, bad. So, lifetimes later, a strange old lady brings to me and my husband a bowl of water. She holds it in her two hands. Chinese will serve ordinary tea with the attention of both hands. I hope she means to be making ceremony. I shall take it to be shriving. The bad we did be over. Punishment be over. Suffering be over. Is that it then? Wet my hands in the well water, the bowl like the well, and my wet face like my sinful ants. Perhaps the well water had been offered innocently. I, the only one who remembers the past and believes in history's influence and believes ritual settles scores. My husband by my side, blessing himself as if with the holy water of his youth, was stand-in for the rapist lover, forgiven, curse lifted, war over. Can it be that uh, there are terrible things that happen in life and there is nothing we can do about it except write about it and make ceremony? I like very much finding the word shriving uh, to use in this section because it, uh, shriving uh, comes from a uh, 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 Middle English word, which means to write, and it also means to, um, to make atonement. Oh, good. OK. All right. Okay, so now I will take questions. Yes. I thought I heard the Campanile would go six. <laughs> Yes, hi, Sean.
or uh, yeah, death in America. So can you like explain how our tiny world would improve America, i.e. overcome this idea of death or <laughs> image of death? You know, the, what I was writing about, that Chinese girls are taking over America. Uh, what I'm thinking, I, I, am, I am just observing how many uh, adopt, adopted girls now, that everybody I know has an adopted Chinese girl in their, cla uh, in, in their family. And, uh, and these girls are adopted into the best families. I mean, uh, China is very careful to make sure that the, the girls do go to good families, and they and they truly are. These families are going to make sure that they get the best education. Um, that's the main thing: the best education, and uh, and then uh, and then they and you know what I picture: these Chinese girls. They're all going to grow up to be like me. <laughs> and they are going to have my values, and uh, and then and then we we just take over. And <laughs> okay, then the, the Sean's question has to do with how does that connect up with the the way time is in a line? Um, I don't know, but <laughs> I what, what I was thinking about was the. Um, uh, the, the, in the East, uh, there is more of a sense that uh, that time um, goes in circles and uh, cycles. Uh, there are the cycles of the zodiac, the cycles of time, uh, the uh, the eras of uh, of history, um, and uh, and. Uh, the way the seasons go in circles and planets and stars and so on. Uh, so the Ch uh, Ch Chinese really do see time as um, is something that goes around and around. Uh, we reincarnate and reincarnate. Whereas, um, and we all know that uh, in, in the West, uh, there is such a linear sense. And what I was, I, I just thought that that was so clear um, in the, um, w when we look at heart monitors, the way, you know, when somebody dies, it just flattens out. And then I think, wow, that's just a line. Uh, maybe the answer to your question is that um, uh, being um, uh, this, this idea of, um, of time going in circles, it also has to do with uh, renaissance and renaissance and uh, 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 a new birth happening again and again. And that's how it connects to the Chinese girls. All these wonderful new young Chinese girls giving uh, a renaissance to, uh, to the world. <laughs> Anyone else? Don't be shy. I can't imagine I, oh, you know, I, uh, before I get back to you, if there isn't, you know what I was expecting people to ask? I was expecting somebody to ask, now what is the difference between prose and poetry? And now, did you think of asking that? And since I was so worried about somebody asking that, I came up with an answer. So I really, I want to give you the answer. Okay, here's the answer. When you're writing prose, you have no control over the margins. The, uh, whatever the printer or whatever your computer does, the, the, that, that is the margin. And poetry, you, the writer, the poet, controls where the line begins and ends. Okay. Is that great? And I was wondering if, if that book has influenced you. And 
And I was also wondering how else have you prepared yourself for nonviolence? I I do feel that I am um, influenced by the Bhagavad Gita and even the Kama Sutra. Uh, I mean, all those um, I, I read when I was very young, and those uh, ideas and rhythms um, are, are go into my uh, writing. I, I from uh, from those ancient texts, I. I get the idea that uh, that sound makes a, a tremendous difference in um, uh, in our bodies and in the atmosphere, and uh, and in ears. That if we can just get the right sounds, uh, the right music, um, we can influence the world. And um, and in in. Uh, in ancient writings, there's there's ideas about um, th there are words that are peaceful. Um, th is there a way that uh, we could find um, vocabulary and um, ways of writing, not just vocabulary, but the sounds of language itself, so that we can um, uh, make um, so that we can make people, uh, we, can, we, we can convey uh, love and a peaceful, good feelings to one another. Uh, so um, it, so I, I just want to answer that not in terms of how um, the ideas of nonviolence, such as satyagraha or, or what Martin Luther King taught us. I mean, they taught us ideas. But what I'm looking for are, um, the ways of writing, the sounds of, of nonviolence and peace and love. Okay, Sean, I guess you can ask, ask your second question. So 10, 11 years ago, you read, wrote a poem called Memorial. Uh, I, I wrote what? Memorial? Huh. 9-11? Oh, yes, yes, I remember, yes. Yes, out there, right out there. Yeah, yeah. Did you anticipate, when you read that, composed that poem, did you anticipate that we would be in our 11th year, 10th year of war? I mean, it was interesting as I progressed to um, a broad margin that a lot of it was reference to um, the soldiers mm -hmm. in Iraq. Mm -hmm. What Sean is talking about was that on um, on September 11th, I, was it on the 11th or the 12th that we all met out there? Uh, and and uh, yeah, it was a couple of days, maybe next day or the two days afterwards. And, uh, and we just filled all that area out there and there were people out the windows and on the roof and, uh, and, and just trying to, uh, Think of how how are we as this uh, Berkeley community? How are how are we uh, responding to what happened? And and uh, and and we are responding by being together. We will we will go through this together. And uh, I remember uh, being asked to speak at that. Uh, gathering and thinking, I don't know what to say. This is leaving me speechless, and uh, um, and all I could think of was, um, I I will, I will get a big Tibetan bell and uh, and I will ring it, you know, a Buddhist bell, and ring it. Uh, 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 and let the voice of the Buddha come out of this bell, and, uh, and then we hear the bell, and then and then there's the silence after the bell, which is a peaceful silence, and we all sit there, uh, and and we are all uh, together feeling uh, the atmosphere that we have created. 
Okay, so I remember taking the bell and ringing it 11 times. The same thing that we do on November 11th, which is Armistice Day uh, uh, and Veterans Day. Uh, this People do that all over the world on November 11th. So we did that on September 11th. And then um, I, I remember thinking, I know what's going to happen. Um, we are going to use this as an excuse to go to war. And that was what I w talked about, uh, that this that every war is a civil war. Every war is brother against brother, sisters against sisters. And, uh, and uh, th then I, I just tried to make a warning. Let's not go to war. And, uh, and of course, um, uh, we did. And, uh, and who knows that uh, when it will end. It's, I mean, just because it's officially announced it's over, it's not over. Uh, you went on to think about, um, uh, you also asked about our peace tactics as war keeps going on. And I think we just have to remember that uh, our, um, when we practice nonviolence, we do it for the long term. And uh, we, um, we always work in the long term and we do each thing. If this even works when we think about um, uh, uh, Hitler. I know that this is the main argument against uh, nonviolence, saying, well, what about Hitler? Um, the only answer I can think of is that, you know, people elected Hitler. Uh, he was voted in. And so can we go back, step back a little, and, uh, uh, and take each step at a time and think, wait, um, is this, uh, what are the conditions that set up a, uh, uh, such a person to run for office? And uh, what are the conditions that make him win? And, and then you just keep working on each small thing as we go along. And then we will prevent the wars that are coming in the future. Yes. Yes, it's so good to see you again. You know what? I should have brought the bell. <laughs> that would have been a great way to end this. <laughs> We would certainly love to have Maxine back to ring the bell anytime. I'm sure you would all agree, so we'll have to plan something else when you finish one of those other easy books of poetry. <laughs> oh, I noticed that uh, we are all sold out of To Be the Poet out back there, so I will sell the, my reading copy if anybody wants it. <laughs> and we also have your veterans book over there. Oh, good. Okay, everyone, so yes, please do visit the ASUC book sale table here, and then the author will sign in the back corner there. Please try and be a little bit orderly. I know we have a large crowd today. And I look forward to seeing you next month. We'll be here on May 5th, the first Thursday of the month next month, for our student reading, our third annual. So please hope to see you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>